Borderline personality disorder. An instability of self-image, relationships, and mood. Uncertainty about goals, impulsive in activities that are self-damaging, such as casual sex. I like that. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hollywood Gold. I'm your host, Daniela taplin Lundberg, and I'm here with Bex Camerata. We're about to interview Kathy Conrad, who we love. is such an iconic producer. Uh, we're about to get into Girl Interrupted, which is a movie I've just recently would, rewatched. Angelina Jolie won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. And the movie is like pretty iconic and just yeah. has so much a sense of style. And it's clear that Jim Mangold, who is the filmmaker and Kathy, put a ton of work into this. And... Um, I think it really, really holds up so well. My, my daughter is a huge fan of this movie, so I can't wait to get going. Let's do it. Kathy Conrad, you're a comeback kid, meaning you've done this once before with me. And you've agreed to do it again. Yes, I have. You're going to get a free sweatshirt. Really? I'm going to send you, could, I'm gonna send is you a sweatshirt. Is it blue or black? <laughs> <laughs> You're getting the Navy or the E-Crew. I haven't decided yet. but um, Navy, please. I'm so excited to see you. I'm so excited to uh, explore Girl Interrupted, which I'm sure you haven't talked about in many years. Or maybe you have. No, I actually, I had to go, I, I like went and got my script that I have, ba- like I went and I, I went and got my little file of all our, re- like I was like, it's just been a minute since I've spoken about it. And um, it was kind of, I was a little like, gosh, like, what do I remember? So take me back, because I did a little research and I just want your first memory and we can go from there because I know like you partnered Doug Wick, like acquired the initial book and Winona was like super right. thrilled and excited and engaged. Yeah. So take me back to your first memory and set the scene. So my first memory, it was, it was interesting because I had, I, I really had to metabolize this. It was the first time that Jim, we had been approached to do something that was not already something that was something I was building from scratch or an idea of his. It was kind of what I would consider putting on my big girl pants, a studio thing. And it was really interesting because, um, you know, I had only been really in that indie space at Miramax in all those movies. And so much of those were, it was such a specific process over there as I'm sure many have spoken about. It was, um, uh, I just kind of put it in one sentence as the Wild West and leave it at that. Mm-hmm. You had to be very scrappy to get movies made there. And it was really flattering. You know, uh, Winona had seen Heavy, which is Jim's first movie, which was an unreleased movie that had premiered at Sundance and was really taken by uh, by that character work in there and really wanted to have a meeting. And Carol Bodie, who was Winona's manager, reached out to me and to Jim and you know, Winona really kind of took the reins of this. I mean, it had wow. been at Sony for a while. You know, the book had been optioned, you know, right when it came out, like in 93 or 94, yeah. right after Susanna had written it. And it had, it had seen a couple of writers, you know, Lisa Loomer, who was a great playwright, had done a few passes on it. And then it kind of sat there for a minute, I think, like as we've all experienced in development gestational periods. And it was just kind of laying there going, what do we do now? And Winona kind of really was the champion for it. It had been a book of tremendous significance for her personally. And, you know, it was really her passion. It's like kind of like we all as producers have that passion project. And this really had spoken to her. She had had a, you know, a history herself of some struggles with thoughts and at various times. And so it was really, really important and so that's how it began. And can I ask you, Kath, was, were you and Jim sort of being courted by the studios yet at this point? Or were you still sort of like existing in a sort of independent space and building your own things and pushing things up a hill? Well, Copland, I mean, I had a deal with Miramax still at the time, which was kind of a strange evolution from, you know, when I had worked with Carrie Woods that then became my own deal. It was Conrad Pictures. You know, I had a lot of other things cooking with them 
as well as commitments with, you know, Jim still had a commitment that he, you know, through the deal that he made with Copland, which then became Kate and Leopold. So I was kind of like straddling these two universes. But like I said, I'd never really been inside in the producerial role, that kind of more polished, system-driven, meeting-driven, conversational, like process-driven studio deal. I guess I, I sort of, it's, uh, I look at it like My Fair Lady. Like I was really raw and just kind of like, ah, you know, like how you have to do it. I looked at material very differently. I mean, I know Jim had the same response when he read the script. He, he felt like there wasn't enough edge or teeth in it. It felt very soft to him. I agreed. I'm like, what is even this? Like, I don't understand. And, and then we met with Nona and, you know, she was very eloquent about kind of her ambition for it. And then it became about how do you put this together? Like, what's the bandwidth for this? And that's the part that's really interesting to me when I look back and I go, like, I've done a kind of a little secret poll with my friends that are producers. I'm like, hey, you know, if someone came to you with this script and said, hey, it's a really good script, like, what do you think, like, you'd say the budget would be for this? (laughs) And they all say, like, five or six million. I'm like, yeah, right. You know how much we got to make that movie for (laughs) in 1998? How much? $35 $35 million. Dude. Right. I've kind of had a little, like, my own journey through the Wizard of Oz of movie making back in time to the process. And I'd say that the way it ran back then, there was something really very, you know, the nostalgic part of me is just kind of going back, thinking about how we location scouted that movie, for example, which was like, like in all the meetings we had in person, you know, just... It was such a different kind of experience. You know, I think as a, as, a, as a boomer, as my sons call me, I'm looking at like the way technology has kind of advanced us on so many levels. It's sophisticated. It's, yeah. it's here. It's available. It's so great. But it's also very lonely sometimes. When, you know, when I went back and, you know, 100%. looked at that. Uh, the synergy of how we cast that movie, the connections that everybody had in order to make that movie. Um, There was something really kind of nice about it. I read that when Nona felt that when Jim came in and you guys came in, it was the first time that she felt like a filmmaker really understood it. And I, and I, you say Wizard of Oz and I feel like that was a reference that was used as a framework a little bit. Can you talk me through that a little bit? First, we read Susanna's book, which was so personal and so interesting and, you know, filled with all the themes that were interesting to explore. But really, I think even Susanna Kaysen said it. It's like, how are you going to do this? Like, what is the story? And I think that, you know, Jim, as well as other filmmakers that I know, always try to put an overlay of a paradigm of like, What's the journey? What's the, how do you tell this story? Victor Fleming's Wizard of Oz is such a great idea. But the other thing that Jim was working on in this is, is about time, you know, passage of time. How do you tell a, a story about how somebody goes in some place and comes out the end of a journey in another place without spending too much time getting into the granular thought process. You know, how do you introduce this many people? How do you do it? And Slaughterhouse Five was a favorite film of he and I, and we talked about time, the time wheel. How do you go in the past and come out and how the time wheel moves and you can be in one place and the the transitions in the film that get you to another place. And so so that it feels sort of seamless. And so that motif is used. And so I think he really connected with Winona about that because I think that there is this piece of this movie creatively that speaks to not being able to identify exactly what you're feeling, what you're thinking and why you are where you are. You just know you're there and then you have to figure out how you get there, how you get to the end of there. And is there a there there? You know, it's like, what is it? And, you know, Winona had come to us with, you know, that Vermeer painting, you know, the girl interrupted by her music, which is really kind of became this image that we thought a lot about. And I, it's why I Mm. kind of pulled up my script because I remember, um, you know, one of the last lines, which is really, 
It says, her last line is, now when something weird happens, I ask myself, shit, am I still crazy? I ask myself, was I crazy then? Or was I like that girl in the painting, interrupted at the music of being 19? Mm. We always talk about time. So time and, and how to frame time and feelings around that, and then a character story with narrative drive. So that it just didn't feel like little episodes, because that's sort of like what Susanna's book felt like. And there were great characters in there. It was very delicate, though. It didn't have any kind of edge or muscle to it. And there was a lot of conversation about Lisa, which did not exist really in Susanna Kaysen's book. I mean, Lisa was, she existed, but she didn't have the kind of ferocity or intensity that mm. uh, that became a little bit of an engine, a little bit of a pressure point for exploring the drama and some of the themes in this. How did that idea like sort of rear its head and was Winona supportive of that? Yeah, well, it's interesting because we're, we're talking about two separate parts. Like Lisa was written before it was Angie and it wasn't written for Angie. Of course, now on reflection, like no one can think about it independent of Angie because of what she did with that part. But the part of Lisa was really meant to challenge some of Winona's choices and her own kind of perspective on how she's thinking about this time in her life. It was, we needed somebody poking at her and it didn't have that. It was really, the book was really about when are you going to decide to be sane but there was no voice for it. It was all internal. It was more of an existential crisis. And that's kind of, you know, it's often that way in movies, like some of the most beautiful, poetic, great pieces of literature that we read, we identify with because it speaks to our insides. But when you're making film, you have to get that stuff out somehow. And it can't every, not everything can be voiceover or exposition. So who can speak to that other half of us somehow. And, and that's kind of how Lisa began to evolve a little bit as a character. You had a version of the script, you pitched on it, you guys won the day. Did Jim just take the script then and like do a rewrite on it? We were working on something else and Anne Hamilton Phelan came on. So there was Lisa and then we took oh, Anne's sure. draft. Then we worked with Anne. We did several passes with Anne and she did some great work. I mean, she really did. And then, you know... Then we kind of came in. I mean, we were weaving throughout, you know, with collaborating with Winona, too, and obviously the studio. And then became, uh, you know, what Jim likes and, and does really well, more than structure. Because I would say he had specific ideas about certain places of structure and how to use, like, we have a montage in there that uses a song. He had a couple of very clear places where we go in and out of the past and present. And then it was just about character voice work, which when you're working with a movie like this, it's the same process we had on Walk the Line and, and even on Identity and some others. When you, once you have an actor involved and you start kind of messing around, it just starts popping, you know, with that. How did you guys get to green light? Was it like Winona, Jim, you guys, like you guys were a go? Once people started hearing about it, it became... Uh, kind of this thing that we were all getting calls on about actresses mm. with big names, be it Courtney Love or even, you know, Alanis Morissette was really big at the moment and she had wanted to meet on it. And we're like, what? Alana, what? Like, what? like we were like, who? What? Like, really? That's incredible. like everyone wanted the part of Lisa. Everybody wanted the part of anybody like every. Yes. But OK, Lisa, OK, OK. But, you know, there was there was a lot of chewing on that. Yes, it was obviously Winona was already. Susanna. So the next big part was Lisa. But we still had a lot of other beautiful girls to cast too, you know, and they were all very interesting roles. But Lisa was just raw on that page. And I think girls love the idea, like I think the actors like to play messy people. Like they really want to play like messy, fucked up, damaged people <laughs> like like that part is cool you know and, and there's like some humor there yeah it is cool and it's it's it rides such a razor's edge of all that you could possibly be it was not black or white you know reese witherspoon um you know gretchen Ma i mean so many people everyone came in to read 
everybody came in to read. Wow. Do you remember that, Kath? Do you remember that process oh, yeah, of just yeah. watching these girls come in? And Yeah. I mean, I remember like Lisa Beach going, I mean, I can't even like, I'd look at the session sheet, like again, back in the day, we did all of this in real time. So we'd set aside a room and we'd get the session sheets and I'd look at it and I'm like, wait, what? Like who? What? what, what? Like, really they're come they're reading like only this one time and only for seven minutes and you know alicia no silverstone and this way. you know and so you're just kind of like going i mean it was just such a um it was such an interesting process because usually with miramax you're like it has to be this person <laughs> you know it's like you know and then we're like no we want a newcomer and then, and then it's you, you have all these people just begging to to read you lie down, you confess your secrets, and you're saved. Ka-ching! Well, the more you confess, the more they think about setting you free. But what if you don't have a secret? Then you're a lifer like me. Susanna, four days ago, you chased a bottle of aspirin with a bottle of vodka. I had a headache. Did it feel like there was a dearth in the market for such like meaty female characters or why was everyone so excited about this? I mean, I even remember that like there was such a buzz about this movie and how like edgy it was and cool. Yeah, I think it was really, again, I have to go, you know, I go back to remembering the time because we're in such a world right now where the focus is on diversity and female and we want every inclusion no matter what. And back then we were still in the model of sort of more of this mainstream old school model that certain people had to pass the bar and everything else was just swimming around down below the surface somewhere. And if you were lucky enough to have a champion and lucky enough to know someone, maybe they'd help you edge it up. But female driven material like this, like a dramatic ensemble with all women really hadn't been done, you know? And I think in going through all my old history stuff, like I, I saw a quote from Rose McGowan, hilariously, which basically said what was so exciting about it was that um, it was one of the first scripts that you read where like women didn't have to take their clothes off to get the part. And I thought, like, that's so true. It's so true. What I loved about it, too, kind of the modern interpretation of Susanna's period work, even though we set it in period, was just kind of asking that question, like, what is crazy? <laughs> like, what is what is a problem? And what is just being a woman and where we get put, the boxes we get put in for having feelings about things that we're not allowed to express. But I think at that time, what's interesting is the sort of the disregard or the, or we don't know what to do with you right now. So you just go over there and have a rest. You know, I love the Vanessa Redgrave character. I loved Whoopi's character. I, I think, again, I kept expecting convention. I kept expecting Nurse Ratchet, right? Like, <laughs> I, I kept expect, And you guys kept, like, contradicting the, like, the standards of what I would imagine a place like that would be. And so I really loved that. And it was almost like um, a more humanistic, like, feminine, warm environment than what I would have expected that to be. And mm -hmm. so I was so impressed with that. And I was sort of wondering if you had like your hand in that at all. That's where the process of making this movie I thought was really interesting because where is this world? You know, obviously McLean was the institution in Boston that Susanna went to, which was a very storied mental institution, Sylvia Plath. I mean, there was a lot of people that went there. And we couldn't shoot in Boston, of course. And, and But we wanted to feel like we were, you know, in a place that had a very specific East Coast, old world feeling around it, someplace where period still existed in its own time bubble. From a shooting point of view, when you have a bit of a budget, the question always becomes, well, why didn't you build it versus why didn't you find it? And 
back then when we were making this movie, shooting on location obviously had a benefit to it, more so than shooting on a soundstage at the studio, which was much more costly. And we went to three different states. And, and why I remember, it was so funny because we flew into Baltimore, which was where I grew up, which was kind of really interesting. You know, I lived in the city in my senior, uh, junior, senior year, and I had like three waitressing jobs to pay my student loan. And one of them was at the Rusty Scupper in the Inner Harbor, and which is so funny because <laughs> it's like, so here I am now. I'm, I'm, I'm the good Maryland girl gone to Hollywood, right? And um, nothing, you know, huge had happened, but of course, scream and. And I remember the Baltimore, the film commission was like, oh, we're going to put these guys up. And oh, G Kathy Conrad, you can have the presidential suite of the Hyatt. You and No Jim. way. I remember going out on that balcony and looking at the whole inner harbor and seeing the deck of the Rusty Scupper where, you know, I always had to work this shift, which was like sport night or something. And it was like, you know, happy hour, <laughs> which is just the rudest people. Like I'm, I'm in this really nice room and I'm like looking at my past life. It was so interesting. Oh um, we didn't end up shooting. That was a long story about Baltimore. We didn't end up obviously staying in Baltimore, but we had a bus. And from there we drove to Ohio. No way, like a band? All of us in this 25, like a bus with the our, our film executive, Bill Ewing, who worked for, uh, you know, he was our executive, our production executive. And, 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 and it was so funny because it was such an experience that Jim and I were like, like, why is the studio coming? Like, we were like so mad. Like, we're so in, we're like, why are they here? And they're spies. Like everybody, like, what, what are they spying on us? Like, why can't we have our own space? Like, we're just, just, oh my God, Kath. That is we so were in like this van and I'm like, and, and I remember Bill going, oh, you're going to love Ohio. And they make these cookies, these Buckeyes. I'm like, I don't give a shit about a peanut butter cookie. Why am I in this van for hours looking at <laughs> So we went to Pennsylvania. We ended up in Ohio and we ended up shooting in Ohio in Mechanicsburg at the, at, 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 and Harrisburg. That was a great location. Which was an amazing location. And, uh, but touring all these mental facilities, to your point about the feeling of them, they were all, they were so beautiful on the outside and they felt kind of haunted on the inside. Like mm. you just, and Richard Hoover, who was our production designer, just really, he was the one that brought Ward 81 to our attention, which is this book of uh, photographs by Mary Ellen Mark. And, you know, it became, oh, cool. well, this is black and white. There was a lot of uh, beautiful imagery in here that captured kind of, you know, more of the joy of, of some of these experiences and just some of the, some of the yeah. textures of, of these mm -hmm. experiences cool. and some of the fashion. And it was just really beautiful like this was so much like Clea to me Georgina you know with the macrame yes. and the crochet and her so it was really <sighs> just kind of like how do we dial into what was really cool about the 60s and Ariane Phillips who was such a genius uh, costume designer loved the costumes loved the costumes and Angelina's so timeless coat, felt very timeless yeah and Angelina's coat which felt you know, which is often talked about. Uh, I remember when she found that at a flea market and Arion has such a beautiful process too of really understanding costume as character and how mm. you, who that person is and what they're using their costumes for and how they present it, but it's all very subtle. And so we have this amazing group of people very early on and we're collaborating in conversation with us in the early, early days, like, uh, so when we get to these places and we're looking at it and you're just, the shapes of that institution were really beautiful, kind of the round great room, the way the, the nurse's room, the way the corridors worked, it didn't feel like it was just so sterile. It felt like it was open to see everything, but from a certain point of view, which was really helpful from a filming standpoint. And then Richard had ideas about the color of the paint and you know obviously there's this green that everybody thinks about as institution but there's so many tones of that that also come into play and then how you see nature out the window that's the part like as even as I'm talking about it now like was so fun 
you don't have the rich conversations about that. I mean, people now are just like, okay, yeah, sure. Anyway, um, let's go. Like, right, right. On, like how quickly can we get this done? And I'm like, sure it'll be great. Anyway, yeah. we don't want to hear about your palette of, you know, whatever. <laughs> no, it was just. No, but like to me, like being in that bus together and like it feels of a piece and it feels very like thoughtful and kind of beautiful in a way, despite like the backdrop of what we're dealing with. And that's what I noticed. We were all very dramatic back then too. Like, you know, we were all very <laughs> expressive. <laughs> we all, we were all very <laughs> firm about thoughts and things. And yeah, I love it. I love, I mean, just like even her, like her hair. And we talked about Courtney Cox's hair, like a lot on screen, on the scream episode, mm-hmm. Kath, but like, but like her pixie haircut and like her big eyes yeah. and like the striped shirts that were like French inspired and like the framing. And I was just like, this is, this is gorgeous. It's all portraiture, you know, and it's. Yeah. Like- and Ariane, we made, she made those, you know, there was like, you know, that whole French resistance idea, like, yes. like through this, yeah. through the costumes and, you know, the Galois cigarettes, like the, what she smoked. And just the idea of French resistance relative to her character and how that kind of became the neckline and the and and just what her coat looked like uh, versus, you know, Daisy, Brittany Murphy, daddy's oh, little and girl the, and, and, the, uh, and the model of that woman versus someone who's fashions themselves to have their own voice and then the undoneness and just the raw nakedness of Angie and I remember yes she was so specific coming in and she came in with this wig did she wear a blonde wig in the in the audition no 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 not in the audition okay she 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 came in with this color that she wanted her hair to be with this thing (laughs) for like Mm. I mean honestly it was just so ugly I mean it was the ugliest color like you could just you go. was that meaning the color that ended up in the movie yeah just this kind of straw mustard yeah just like and and the non she was like very naked like everything for her had to be naked like exposed and yeah just- yeah just everything had to mm-hmm. be like nude lips no this naked beige pants dirt the t-shirt naked and I remember, uh, God love it, Amy Pascal, you know, was running everything at the time. And I honestly don't think the movie would have gotten made if she wasn't there because Amy was such a champion of women's voices, you know, in her own way. And this was very special to her. And I think she was very instrumental in that green light is uh, coming back to that story. But we were doing hair and makeup tests as one did back in the day. And, you know, I got that phone call you know, it's Amy and, you know, she wanted to talk and, and she was very concerned that Angie wasn't wearing a bra. And it's like, yeah, I, no, I don't think she's, no, she's not going to, well, she has to, because, you know, it was like, you know, one, she's not, it's not symmetrical. You know, you just sit here and you go, you know, you just kind of go, I'll think about how to communicate that. And then it becomes seven meetings about how you're going to tell this actress who who was very you know intimidating is the wrong word she was just very already dug in like she was already she she was very much in her face Mm. so the lisa that you saw on screen was very much what walked around the set 24 set there was no coming out of that girl Whoopi was so funny and fun to have because she refused to stay in a hotel and she has this giant bus. She has this tour bus, right? And I remember John Fogelman was her agent. We would go back and forth. It's like, she's not staying in a hotel. She has a bus. And I'm like, well, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Like, what is this? Bu- like, do I have to pay for this? Like, I don't, it's not in the budget of bus. It's like the driver, the bus, It's and she drives back and forth, but that doesn't match the day out of days. It was like a whole other thing. It's like, she's in charge. She's got this bus. And he's like, Kathy, all I can say is like, she comes with the bus. I'm like, okay. So you have to figure out what is this bus? And there was a lot of conversations about it. And not only that, but, you know, the mental institution that we shot at was an active institution. So, you know, John's like going, she's going to like just stay out there. And then that way there's no drive time. I'm like, yeah, but it's like, there's 
like we're at a mental institute. Like where is she going to like just park the you, bus here? Like I, well, then we, we should get a security guard. And I'm like, you know, you're like uh, the budget, like we don't have a security guard. So that, you know, it's like all these meetings. Oh my God. Kevin. Remember when she pulled in on that thing and you know, it's just like, imagine Mick Jagger on tour, like this thing rolls in. It's like that big. And I remember Whoopi calling me to her trailer and meaning her trailer or the bus, the bus, the bus. Okay. She, because she wanted me to, she knew all these conversations had been going back and she's very light and fun. And she's like, I want to show you this bus. I'm going to show you why I'm staying here. I'm like, sure. And I like the door opens and I walk in and I'm like, there's like a Picasso. She's got, she's got like <laughs> Gucci toilet paper. I'm like, I was like, you know, we're in like the double tree over here and we're, you know, I mean, it was like a gold toilet oh, paper thing. I mean, I'd never seen Gucci toilet no. paper before, but it was. It was like stamped with no, the G's on it. <laughs> but if you remember this moment in time, I guess it was very nine. It was a very big thing to have that. I guess they did that, you know? You are not crazy. And what's wrong with me? Huh? What the fuck is going on inside my head? Tell me, Dr. Val, what's your dying nonsense? You are a lazy, self-indulgent little girl who is driving herself crazy. I'm so sorry. I was a pig. I was a pig. Do not drop anchor here. So would Whoopi sort of stay above the fray? Yes. Yeah. She she would come in. What I loved about her, she would come in and she would just, she would always be able to tell. She was like sort of uh, Madame Clairvoyant. She'd come in. She's like, oh, everybody, it's that time of the month, huh? Like, so I'd get, like everybody, oh, no, everybody no. sunk up. Like, let's just put it that way. Oh, it was kind of interesting because, uh, and I think Winona spoke about this quite well. There were a lot of stories about, the attention or, or between she and Angie, but I don't think that was really true. I think she kind of summed it up right, which is, you know, Angie made a decision that she couldn't really be friends with Winona. She, she did not want to extend herself to be that person and develop that kind of relationship with her because then it would just throw her off. And so I think it was confusing for, and I've seen this now. I mean, that was, kind of a very new experience because obviously the scream experience, which had been before was so camaraderie. Nobody was pretending to be anything other than what they were. At this point in your career, I'm curious because I did a movie with Shia LaBeouf where he was very much in character the entire time. Right. And it's like, mm -hmm. he does not break character. That is the role he's going to play in his mind. That's the only way he's going to achieve the like level of performance that he wants to achieve. And I remember speaking to someone who was sort of close to it and was like, we've been rehearsing for six weeks. Mm -hmm. Like he did as well on in day two as he's done in week mm -hmm. six. But in his mind, it's like he's building towards this thing. And do you buy that, that like, these actors who never break and are always in it and believe that that's the thing that's going to create the performance that really launches them. Do you buy that? I mean, I buy that they believe that, but do you think that that is what's required for certain people to achieve that level of excellence? Jim and I would often be at odds about this because, you know, based on our roles, mm. And I don't think I fully understood because I felt like I was often under pressure about time and just sometimes these exercises in becoming oneself or staying in self or finding the character in the scene in the day is smacking up against just logistics that are impossible. And I think that I do respect an actor's process. I think these people have to do an incredibly difficult job each is an individual. I don't think there's a one size fits all. And I've seen it work to the advantage, but like Angie, for example, came in her audition. She was Lisa. Like there just wasn't a question about it. Like she came in 
in a white t-shirt with no bra, just kind of came in, right. sat down in a chair like this, was two feet from Lisa Beach, hunched over like how her posture was, had a script with dog eared, like it looked like it was it was yeah. a you know, a snack for animals in a pound, and just mm-hmm. read the a guy is a dick, is a dick, is a cute I mean, just went just went in it. Ugh. And there was no like slate and high on it's just and then she just read four more scenes and got up and left. Thanks and left. And we're all like I mean, it was oh it was sort God. of just like I just got the chills. That's wild. Yeah, and Lisa said, I mean, she she I will give her credit for this. She said there is the Academy Award for the Best Supporting Actress, and she was right. <gasps> for her, particularly, I think you know she spoke about this. For it was it was it was where she was in her life, and I think you know Winona was where she was in her life, and I think actors do bring in. They have to bring in pieces of themselves. Otherwise, they can't do that. Or they do the research and really get into it, be it through accent or physicality. Somehow, something has to become so real to them that they can really go there and take you there as an audience with it. My daughter, who's 15, watched Girl Interrupted, and she made all her friends watch Girl Interrupted. Oh. And like, it's having this, it really does have this like lasting impact and and my daughter's someone who likes movies, but like does not watch everything, you know? And I just wonder if you've heard that at all and why you think it still resonates. And those performances are also good. And there's such care taken with the movie. I think that's part of it. You know, it's not slapped together. And you probably haven't thought about this in like forever, but it's in the lexicon, you know? Yeah, I, I've thought about it only, you know, when we did Q&As for this and went out and about, what was really rewarding, because I wouldn't say that the release set the world on fire, because it wasn't, it didn't fit a box that I think people really understood how to market the movie to get it out to people. And I don't think this was the kind of movie that people really understood who's the audience for, which is kind of interesting, and the lack of mail in it. It's just, it's so interesting to examine. Mm. But when we went out in the world and we're more grassroots and going out to these Q&As, just the feeling and a lot of the talks were, the audiences were filled with girls. Mm -hmm. And they would come up and talk about how much this movie meant to them and how much it spoke to them and how much it felt like, oh, I, it's the first time I've seen something that speaks to things that I feel. And that's what I think, transcends time is feelings in general and finding someone that is like these girls were avatars for a lot of people. And I think they carry with them as character types. Yeah. Even though each of their problems were individual, I think they carry with them this idea of how confining it can feel to be judged or stereotyped or diagnosed to be an outsider And I think that what I love about this movie, too, is you can look at it a little bit like being an outsider. And there are things that need to get addressed in how you think about yourself and how you think about yourself in the world. Mm -hmm. But there's this idea that we find ourselves through relationships with other people in different and unique ways. And girls are so different, how we process stuff, how we process feelings, what our story of origin is, what kind of support we have. And I don't think those movies get made much, you know? And I think COVID, I think anxiousness, anxiety, the world, the pressure of the world, there's so Mm -hmm. much, and there's so much immediacy on a phone that you can drench yourself with this idea that everything's okay. But then when you're in these quiet moments with yourself, like you are in Girl Interrupted, where it's just you in a room and it's night and you can hear what's going on and other drama and connection with other people that you really begin to kind of do some searching and digging. And yes, I just think it doesn't, they don't make these kinds of movies anymore, but they're important, you know, um, and the movie didn't give you a solution. Like it didn't say, do this and then you're out. Like yeah. it didn't say you're going to be better if you take this pill and then you're done. It sort of said that you have to ask yourself a lot of questions and you have to be 
sort of diligent with your own self-inquiry about why you feel the way you feel. And I think this movie gives you a cross-section of how other people tried and how it didn't work for them. Yeah. And how there are better ways to think about how to process them. But again, it's not prescriptive. It's not like if you do this and fill out this journal and wake up with happy I am statements, <laughs> you're going to be fine. <laughs> you know, so I think it just, I think kids like an open ender because if we said this is what you do and they didn't do it, then that would take them out of the experience of the relatability of it, if that makes any sense. A hundred percent. I think that's like exactly what I was looking for. And I think that really resonates. I think like it's, um, it's almost like she uncovered a gem, like this, like this secret treasure that exists, you know, to like explore and talk about these feelings that like there isn't really an opportunity to do that for that being said, like there's so much negative self-harm stuff. On oh, it's terrible. If you go down yeah. that rabbit hole, you know, but I don't think it's framed in the sort of thoughtful way that this movie is. And so I think you hit the nail on the head. I remember when we were finished making it, I mean, th there was a lot of care also with the studio overlay to it. Like, I wonder what would this movie have been you know, if it had been made at Miramax, like what would it have, what would have been the difference? Mm. And I've seen when I, when I kind of went back and looked at stuff, I never knew Lisa Loomer. I wasn't part of that draft process. I wasn't in that development phase with her. And I know that there was some, you know, she had written the softer kind of piece. It didn't. And, and I, I, I think that critically, it's weird to go back and read like reviews of your movie. Like, would you have, like, I don't know if you've ever done that where you just go, no, like, wow, that was really, is that necessary? Like, was that really like, because my experience with these films often comes when I get back in touch with them through people or somebody mm -hmm. saying how much they appreciated something, it feels good because oftentimes it's exactly why I felt good making it or why it was worth every every slog fest you go through, every crucible, every moment. And then you read these kind of just really simplistic statements that people try to measure it up against something. And I think there are films that you just can't measure and say, it should have been like that. It could have been like that. They shouldn't have done this. Couldn't they have done this different? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm grateful for the time that I was allowed to really quite fluently two to three pictures a year, make pictures that were a little bit ambitious that way and keep yes. you wondering, yeah, we're not going to check all your boxes. We can't be something to everybody. But I do feel like Jim did a very good job of trying to satisfy the studio mandate about having the color and having some texture, not going black and white. Because Again, you know, Wizard of Oz, there was a magic to Oz. There mm -hmm. was this idea mm -hmm. that inside yourself, you could be all torn up, but the outside world has to give you something to feel exposed to, different to, and it had to have something alluring to it. You know, the idea of living in abandon and just not having any rules. And I love that this movie had every character, uh. even Jeffrey Tambor, everybody had like this thing that yes you, you know that you could go I'd feel the same way right and it was just the prism and just how you cut that diamond so that it shone, shone a light on each moment even Jared Leto coming in totally being drafted to Vietnam you know just the feeling around war and the country and MLK and the you know just the unease of the environmental rapper and then the ward or our, our mental institution was a kind of a refuge for a minute. And then it sort of speaks to this idea of don't get too comfortable. I mean, that's really what Whoopi was saying mm. in the bathtub scene. Like it's nice to relax for a minute and think that staying here is going to make everything better. Yes. But, but really the challenge we all have as human beings is that, you know, facing the hard to get through it is the only way. And I that's think right. that that's kind of what's really cool about this. And I think that's a timeless message. I totally agree. And I think, you know, even what be telling Winona that she was 
a spoiled brat, you know, in that moment, I had sort of been with Susanna being like, oh, she's in, you know, on her journey. And then like Whoopi's like, get the fuck up, pull up your panties and like, let's go, you know? And like, I was appreciated that in that moment. And yeah, because think about it. Would anybody really say that in one of these places? They'd get thought, you know, like who totally. has the balls to say you're a self-indulgent little girl yeah, and you may have problems, but there is a whole other world here. So it, so, so what I like about the honesty of that too, is it's, 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 it's like, cause Winona is, there's a preciousness to kind of how she's seeing her experience. It's not that there wasn't a problem with her and it wasn't that she was, she was using things that weren't healthy to cope with feelings. They weren't as bad as Georgina. They were different than Polly, but she was still trying to, crash the system and slide out of here. And she was making excuses for not engaging fully in the hardship of living. Yes. And I think that teenagers in particular, and, you know, I have two boys, which is very different than two girls, but, you know, I was talking to my 19 year old son the other day in college and, you know, he's really that freshman year. Like it just brings you back to just, Oh, I just like, but I try to think about, we didn't have this phone and we didn't have these escapes and we didn't have this instant thing to sweep us into another world, which is all fake news on so many levels. Yes. There's no truth to that. And I don't know where you find the truth in that. It's just, you know, uh, it's a curated uh scrapbook of the way people want to be seen. I honestly feel like our kids are the guinea pig generation of social media and phones and screens. And, you know, in five years, 10 years, it's going to be totally different. And they'll, it'll be so much better. I, well, I, that's my hope at least, but like, we, you know, our kids have to just slog through this BS. They do. They have to find themselves in different ways. And I just think again, in revisiting this movie, you weren't allowed to find yourself as a journey in life. You were sent somewhere that told you how to be. And that's interesting because um, it's a different kind of journey. You know, there's so much you don't know on the other side of your choices. And Again, what I like about Girl Interrupted is that we watch Winona struggle with all the questions about identity, self-esteem, value, yourself as an individual, how others see you, how much value you put in that, and then the determination and the grit to say, you know what, I'm not drinking this Kool-Aid anymore. I've kind of wallowed in it enough, and now I got to go figure it out. Maybe I'll end up back here. Maybe I'll have to do something else, but being here this isn't the end game, you know? That was beautifully put. Kathy, you're so smart. I love talking to you so much. Oh, you're so sweet. I heard the phrase 360 producer the other day where, you know, it's just all of it. It's story, mm -hmm. it's narrative, it's budgets, it's holding hands, it's being a mother, being a father, all of it. And I really, as you know, I really look up to you in that in that regard so Aww. thank you for doing this you're the best look forward to your sweatshirt navy yes navy please please navy <laughs> yes okay talk to you soon bye bye maybe the whole world is stupid ignorant but I'd rather be in it I'd rather be fucking in it than down here with you Kathy Conrad so brilliant so smart Rachel just came up with a new phrase for um, two time guests come back kid come back kids so much better as soon as you said it I was like oh Comeback there kids. So, so Kathy is officially a comeback kid. We will be getting her a sweatshirt. And I loved hearing about the experience. I loved hearing about like the bus, taking the bus to like 
all of the locations and just being with your whole crew. And, you know, I think the truth of the matter is the more time you spend in person with people, the more like innovation happens. And it's clear to me that that movie felt like a very holistic vision from, from everything to the set design, to the costume design, to the, to the framing. And so it feels to me like I'm a bit nostalgic for it because Kathy sort of referenced the fact that like we're very much run and gun and on zoom these days. And I think when you can really take the time to be together and like really get to know each other as a crew, the film is impacted positively. And, you know, it's something that Showalter said about his new movie, the idea of you, you know, he was saying that his crew, they all went and lived in Atlanta and they were incredibly close. And it's like, I feel like that film was impacted by that, that sense of like holistic vision, you know? It's a blessing and a curse. I think Zoom and the rise of technology. And like she was saying, it makes life so much easier and you're able to do things that way more efficiently, but you do lose the, like, even in the years that I've been in film, you know, I remember Beasts of No Nation, even Family Fang, like all those pre-production meetings were in person and we would like gather and we would do these big meetings and, now everything's done over Zoom, which again is like, it's good because it allows you to meet more and to be more flexible and people can be wherever, but there's something about the uh, the camaraderie that forms in some of those early days on filming a movie that has, you know, sadly gone away. Well, I think the other thing, and maybe like the industry may be shrinking again, but like more content is not necessarily better, you know? And I think we've just like maybe coming out of a phase Bex where like, Netflix was making so much content. There was so much content coming out of all the streamers because it was sort of like a space race. They were all trying to compete, right? And so there were so many things in production and it was all about like getting things done efficiently and quickly and getting things up on the streaming sites. And now I just, our industry can't sustain it, right? Like the strikes have like indicated that we have to shrink a little bit in order to survive. And part of me is like, that might be a good thing, you know, and maybe we should return a little bit to like being more in person and like not making a thousand things a year, but making a few less, but really good things, you know? And so yeah. I don't know. It's just all sorts of theories. We're constantly spinning out here talking to these really experienced producers, but it does sound like that film definitely benefited from time. From time together and even for, I thought it was so interesting to hear about Angelina's process. Me too. Because I feel like I had, I did have it in my mind that they just did not get along. I feel like that's been the the narrative. Winona and, and Angelina. And so Win- Winona and Angelina and Jolie, yeah. And so to hear that it was really just her being method and her making the decision that she was not going to be friends with, with Winona because that would hint, she felt like that would hinder her performance. So interesting, you know, and I think that I think back to the silver linings conversation we had about Jennifer Lawrence, Mm -hmm. right. Where on the opposite end of the spectrum, she could just snap in and out of it yes, and just be friendly and bubbly one second and then just be like hysterically crying the next. Yes. And so I really liked the question you posed to Kathy about if she thinks that those methods are effective. Right. And I think the answer is probably somewhere in like, who who knows, right? It's whatever works for whichever actor. But Angelina Jolie, as the casting director called, won the Academy Award for that performance. And like she nailed it on day one. Well, and I think uh, one of the fun facts here, which we learned we got more insight into this from Kathy, but but there's a written fun fact that is that Rose McGowan and Claire Danes auditioned for the role of Lisa. But we learned from Kathy that also Alicia Silverstone and I believe Reese Witherspoon also auditioned. I for know that it role. seemed like they saw everyone under the sun. It's so in- incredible. And just trying to imagine, it's like I don't know because that role was so iconic, Angelina. But I guess we say that so many times in these wrap ups, right? That oh, we can never imagine anyone else in this role and someone else had got cast, then you would say that about that person. But it's just, this was such an iconic Angelina role that I, I just, I can't imagine Reese Witherspoon has been doing it. You know? Well, it's so clear that she owned it as soon as she came in the room and she was making a choice and either they were going to like support the choice or not. But this was Lisa to her. 
And I've seen that a few times in a room where like someone comes in and they just do something completely left of center and it either works or it doesn't, you know, you're either going to blow the room away or they're going to be like, that wasn't right. You know, it was a really bold yeah. choice though, you know? So that was really, that was really neat to hear. Oh yeah. We, we, the, she mentioned this and I actually want to look up the painting cause I haven't seen the painting, but that the book and the movie both take their title from the painting Girl Interrupted at Her Music by a Dutch painter. And the ice cream parlor that the girls visit is in Pennsylvania. And the store even has a Girl Interrupted Sunday. I wonder if they still do. I wonder oh. if we could go get a Girl Interrupted Sunday. <laughs> I'm like, they're, they're, <laughs> that's all I have for fun facts. The rest of them are like super It's not dark. a very fun movie. I'm not sure like that yeah. there should be too many more There's fun facts her, like, about Girl Interrupted. Her hand. Like, it's, it's pretty it's intense. That- but honestly, the... Uh, the Whoopi Goldberg bus thing. Oh, I love that. The Gucci toilet paper. Can the we look Gucci that up, guys? toilet paper. Andrew, can we look up if there's actually Gucci toilet paper that exists? That's what's in the 90s. I just don't understand, like, the level of wealth that you would buy Gucci toilet paper. You know what I mean? Like, I know. I'm always, like, trying to figure out, like, what was it that prompted the purchase of the bus with the Gucci toilet paper? Like, was right. it Sister Act what was the thing that Whoopi did that really put it over the top for her, you know? I mean, to be honest, when she was talking about it, I was thinking, that's actually genius. Like, I would love it to just have my own space that can travel. Yeah. And that's where I am on set. And I don't have to just keep going from, like, hotel to hotel. I and know. just upending my life. Just being like, this is my home away from home. And it's mine. So cool. Actually, I think it's a really good idea. <laughs> I know. It would be a good idea for you guys because you guys are on the road a little bit. Yeah. It'd be very smart think for about us to it. take. Think about it. I'll call Whoopi, see where she got her bus. Andrew cannot find the Gucci toilet paper, but like I'm sure it exists. I feel like I that, that was so specific that I feel like it has to be yeah. real. Yeah. And I do remember in the I 90s. I found it. It's real. It is. It's real. It is real. Well, I remember in the 90s and early 2000s, like my aunt and uncle always had the like colored toilet paper to match their bathroom. Like yeah. there'd be pink toilet paper in the pink bathroom and blue in the blue bathroom. Like, wow. Really? I, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm like Gucci toilet paper in the, in this 90s. It seemed like oh not God. too far fetched. Just my my aunt and uncle were not at Gucci level. Should we create Hollywood gold toilet paper? Ooh, I don't know. Just if that's expand the merch. The right. Message. Speaking of which, <laughs> loyal listeners, don't forget that merch. <laughs> um. You do the wrap up. I'm like brain dead. I you know when I've just decided <laughs> I'm brain dead and then like nothing works. Um, well, thank you for listening. Remember to like and subscribe. Press that follow button. Press the follow button. And if you subscribe to the podcast, then you'll get notifications every time we release a new episode. So you'll never have to wonder. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, both at Stay Gold Features and at Hollywood Gold Pod, which is our podcast specific account. And uh, always feel free to DM us with anything that you want to hear us talk about, any producers or movies you want us to feature. And remember to always stay gold. Stay gold. Stay gold.